Hi, welcome back. Okay,、uh, this is Ikai from Thinker Studio. And before、uh, our last talk, and、uh, I also would like to、uh, giving out some briefing of this project. And once again, thanks for your participation. And and we've been been through like a、uh, two days in a row. We have the presentation for five presentation already. And this is our last talk. And and once again, I would like to brief about、uh, the connect with Southeast Asia quote gender issue and racism in the cloud. This project a little bit, and then I will invite two speakers to、uh, give out、uh, their presentation and their talks later. So、uh, this project is uh, organized. Uh, sorry, this、uh, this project organized by Thinker Studio and collaborate with Dance New Class from Singapore, and、uh, the. The project aimed to、uh, start a conversation of gender issue in a society. Also, would like to by gathering a group of artists to develop and adapt ideas to explore the new ways to work and create a collaborate internationally. So,、uh, as we know, the pandemic has already brought limited travel and the global movement. So, online has become、uh, the new model for the international exchange and a connection. So in this project, through being online, we hope the whole residency process, process and experiences can be more accessible to the public. And why we have this、uh, project? I think I'm going to give out the, the the basic idea or the intention at first. So the the original concept and idea is actually、uh, one of the speaker Nabu Taka. Sorry. Nabu Takamori, I cannot really pronounce well in the Japanese name. Yes, and give me the, some ideas、uh, from one of his articles. the The article's name is uh, uh, the title is actually all in Mandarin, and 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 give uh, the, the the brief translation in English. If the international southward art strategy really appears in Taiwan, and in the article there's a paragraph mention about. Uh, Taiwanese society has almost no censorship and the interference against creators. So, if Taiwan can be actively promoted as a platform for the publication and publication and、uh, distribution of prohibited works in Asia region, with these words, it actually give me the idea. So, maybe in this networking of、uh, the, the, the 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 whole project. We can kind of focus on gender issue and also look back the situation that the society, you know, climates, social climates now in Taiwan, in in Asia, in Southeast Asia. So that's one of the reason why we focus the topic of gender for this year. I don't know what would it be in 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 the future or next year, but at least creating the network and also kind of having a platform is important. For us at this moment, and finding a new way to work online,、uh, to to work with the technologies. So、uh, let me introduce the two speakers a bit.、Uh, as I mentioned, because Nabu、uh, Takamori's words and 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 the paragraph of the article article influenced me a bit. So、uh, today I will going to invite him as the first speaker, and then we'll go to the river link. And as we know, Takabu、uh, Nabu Takamori is an independent curator, and also he is the director of Outsider Factory, a, a, a curator collective, a selected important exhibition, curatorial works include South Country, South of Country in two thousand twelve. And then River Lin, we've already kind of well known about him, and he's working across the context of the visual art, performance, and the dance. And 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 in two thousand seventeen, he also founded Asia Discovers Asia Meeting for Contemporary Performance, which we also called it Adam, with Taipei Performing Arts Center. And in this platform, he creates a, a sorry curates annual gathering design. To generate cross culture and uh, uh, exchange between artists in the Asia Pacific region and beyond. So after、uh, the two speakers' presentation and and their talks, I will come up with some、uh, ideas or or questions to to them. 
And the third stage, I, we also will open uh, the, the question to all of the participants. During the whole process, if you have any questions, ideas, and thoughts, please, you can leave the message in the chat box. In the last part, in the QA session, if you want, you can also raise your hand in the reaction function, and we will uh, and turn on your microphone and having the conversation with us. So let's welcome Nabuo Takamori. Hey, thanks, uh, Ikai. Thanks for your introduction. I need to share my screen first with a little bit. Okay. So uh, first of all, I am uh, I am very appreciated to uh, be part of this forum, and I also want to thank the audiences in front of the screen. So. Uh, as Ikai already introduced it, uh, my name is Nobo Takamori, and I work as a visual art curator based in Taipei, Taiwan. And during the last decade, I was work on the field of um, contemporary art exchange between Taiwan and Southeast Asia. So therefore, I was planning to represent the contemporary Southeast Asian arts, which reflect to gender issues. However, during uh, my preparation of this presentation, I just realized the complexity of uh, Southeast Asian arts also includes its art's uh, historical context. So regarding to the gender issues in Southeast Asian arts, uh, which I decided to contextualize uh, this method by the art historical perspective. So, so here we are, uh, it's, it's the title of today's presentation, uh, The Imagination and Representation of Gender Bodies in Southeast Asian Art History. Okay, so uh, today my presentation will divide into three parts. So this will be the first uh, chapter, which is uh, the unmodernized body. So the problematic uh, discourses and the inner complexity of Asia is always related to its modernization. The modernization means the Asian societies were forced to accept and adopt a different kind of social model, which might totally upside down everything in the society, which includes economic, political systems, cultural, and the representation of genders. So uh, these are the photos took by John Thompson. John Thompson is a Scottish traveler uh, photographer during the 19th century. He has been widely traveling around Southeast Asia, Taiwan, and Southern China. Uh, one of the famous uh, photos uh, titled as Taiwanese Sila Young Woman was actually taken by him. And here uh, we show in the two photos, the prime ministers of Siam and his wife, which originally shoot at 1865 during John Thompson traveled to Siam. So uh, Siam is today's Thailand. And when Westerners arrived Siam, they were shocked by the gender's appearance of Siamese peoples because virtually speaking, both genders of Siamese people were adopting the similar haircuts and by Westerners viewpoint, they were almost the similar, uh, they were the almost similar crosses. So it's totally against the meaning of Victorian era, which insisted the differentiate between the both genders, physically and psychologically. So for the 19th century Westerners, the Siemens, pe the Siemens peoples uh, think quite uh, differently. Uh, for them, the Siemens women were too masculinized, and the Siemens men were the Siemens men were too uh, feminineized. So uh, this is the first photo of Siemens kings. Kim Mongut, also known as King Lama, the fourth of Chakri dynasty, is the first photo of Thai kings in the history and was also shot by John Thompson. The most interesting part of this photo is when the king decided to took a photo in the first time of the history, he decided to wear a Western suit. So the suit is not only the clothes, it's also a symbol of modernized. 
and it's also a process to clarify the uncreate Asian body or the uncreate gender bodies in Asia. So by the photo of Kim Mong Good, we could feel the king is not really comfortable to wear the Western suit. However, uh, 80 years later, when he saw when, when we saw the sculptures of Thai kings, uh, we could look at uh, these statues. We can feel that he's a very fit, westernized and modernized uh, body, which have been represented in front of people. So this is a statue of King the Lama the Sixth, which was sculptured by Sipa Pilasis. And Sipa uh, is an Itari born sculptor, but later in during the World War II, he has been uh, changed uh, his nationality from Italy to Thailand. And he, he was also the founder of Sibakong University, the National Arts University of Thailand. So during this case, we could realize after almost a century, the visual representation of Thai monarchies has finally been modernized. And the meaning of modernized, which also means masculine, masculinized. So the similar introduction of Western bodies also has been shown in French uh, colonized Vietnam. Victor Dadert, the founder of Leco de Bozart de Indochine in Hanoi, uh, he has been introduced the French style fine arts educational system to the colonial Vietnam. In his paintings, La Vaccination, the vaccine, we could sort uh, how, the depic how, how he depict the differentiates of the masculine body, which represented the science and the modernity, and compare with the uh, male body, the female body, which represented the Asians who need the help of the uh, modern technique. And uh, it's the wall paintings uh, painted by Victor Dadert which represented in Hanwha's university, we could sort uh, how the depicted of a Western goddess placed it at the center of the world, which is also the symbol of French, the goddess of liberty. In these paintings, we could easily mention the female bodies of classical Western art has been centralized and represented in front of the uh, Asian scholars. And uh, the Japan after Meiji Revolution is also another example of how the monarchies modernized themselves by wearing the Western crosses. However, the Meiji Revolution is not only merely introducing the crossings and appearance decoration, it's also the times which Japanese societies adopted the idea of gender diversion and the values of Christianity about the sexual activity. So uh, when we look back to the Edo periods, so for example, this uh, Yukio Eid of Edo periods, uh, which has been painted by Miyagawa Shushon in uh, 18th century, we could sort uh, two samurais and even sometimes three samurais they stay together for develop their romantic relationship. So in some ways, we could say the modernities created the Asian modern national state. And uh, this kind of Asian modern national state, which at the same time, the modernities also destroyed the great area of gender and homosexuality traditions in Asia. So after we realize how Asian modernizations created a new form of bodies and gendered, and which usually driven and promoted by national government, and uh, the national government also uh, eager to uh, modernize themselves. So here we uh, uh, stepped into the second chapter of uh, presentations. So uh, the chapter two is the representation of savage and the imagination of paradise. So however, on the one hand, by the Western perspective, Asian is still reminds us the land of savages or draw uh, contextualized a place of escape from Western manners 
and an imagined a paradise. So it's a couch, it, it's a sculpture which titled as uh, Olang Odont, a salvaged bonnet. So uh, which was created by French sculptor Emmanuel Frémy. This classical orientalism sculpture shows us the prototype of Western perspective on Southeast Asia. The jungle island of Far East is the place of white and dangerous. However, it's also the place which allows the artistic subject to represent the erotic scene. So before the World War II, uh, Pulau Bali, the Bali Island was an important artistic hub in Southeast Asia for European artists. A Russia-born German artist, Bartosz Bis, was one of the members in these artistic communities on Pulau Bali. His surrealism styles showing us some magical imaginations of Balinese tradition and also represent us the transformed human bodies of locals. Despite his artistic success, uh, Vartosh Beast has been arrested at the end of 1938 until his release in September of 1939 as he has been accused to engage the homosexuality. Some writers has, who has been researched on his life prove he indeed has some relationship with local Balinese young men. Just like the poor Gorgons in Tahiti, the poor, the poor Balinese as a space for escape is not mainly to evoke the artistic talents of artists but also provides an imagined gendered or erotic paradise for Westerners. So on the one hand, we saw how modernized Asian national states would like to perform the modernization to clarify the boundary of genders. But on the another hand, the Western communities still want to keep some space, which allows the magical traditions of blood gender diversion for satisfies the imagination. We could say it, today's Asia is double-sided Asia, which needs to satisfy the safe imagination and also the projection from the others. So I just want to use the chance to introduce the work from uh, Leon Wendt, and it will not take too much time. Uh, Leon Wendt is a Eurasian born in Ceylon, today Sri Lanka. As a photographer, he was highly interested in depicting the local male bodies, which became his primary subject during 1930s to 1940s. And uh, these works are not mainly uh, beautiful, but some of the work are also creative, such like uh, the uh, the note means who stands on the rock. And it's also a metaphoric narrative to represent the paradise of somewhere in far west Asia. All right, so we jump into the end, the last chapter of today's presentations, the chapter three, searching the bodies with identity. So uh, in this chapter, I will uh, introduce two contemporary Southeast Asian arts uh, compared to previous two chapters, which are more focused on the uh, old masters. To show uh, the two artists uh, I like the most and also related to today's issue. So the first artist I want to show is Adam Hack. Adan Haq is from Brunei, and Brunei is a Muslim country. Uh, they have a really uh, very serious restrictions concerned to genders and sexuality. So it's not a country which could be easily deal with contemporary art. Even the dance between a woman and men at public space is not uh, allowed at uh, Brunei. So So uh, therefore, under this context, I realized how Adam's work contains such kind of courage to engage the queer subject 
and uh, all sorts of the courage to participate the related exceptions, such as the exception happened in BACC in Bangkok. So maybe because of this background, I could uh, realize this work is full of poetic narrative. Compared to some queer arts, which are mainly focused on the body itself, the works of Adams represent more about the relationship between the man and his outside world. And another artist I would like to introduce is Anita Yo Alit. So Anita Yo Alit is from uh, Cambodia. In, in fact, she is a Cambodian uh, American. And uh, Alit, uh, Anita is another uh, artist I would, I would like to introduce. So traditionally speaking, when we talk about queer art, we will immediately think about LGBTQ group. And Anita is not under the category of LGBTQ group. However, I feel uh, her work is highly related to safe identity and how the people place themselves in the society. So which I think the spirit is quite connected to the, the queer subject we, we uh, talk about today. So Anita is a female Muslim uh, with Kimet descent, uh, and she's also the second generation of the, uh, of the uh, Cambodian uh, immigrant. So which means uh, she is the minority of the minorities in the society. Not even mentioned uh, the genocide of Khmer Rouge also causes the serious loss in Muslim and Chinese communities during the 1970s and 80s. So under this context, a uh, minority of the society, uh, I think uh, Anita uh, she uh, decided to cross in herself as an appearance of a giant wound, a giant orange wound with the hijab covered uh, her head to represent her uh, Muslim identity. So I'm thinking if uh, LGBTQ as minorities use their body as the narrative methodology to achieve some communication with the societies, then I'm also wondering how a female Muslim could use uh, her body as a platform for carried the safe ironic narrative for readjust or re-communicate with the placement of minorities' genders and bodies in the society. Okay, so so here uh, are the uh, two works uh, I represent uh, of the uh, Anita Yo Alit. So, uh, so so given a uh, short summary to date, uh, my presentation includes uh, three forms of gender bodies. The first is the Asian gender bodies under self-modernization. And the second body is the Asian gender bodies under the imaginations by Westerners. And the final is, I think the most interesting parts, which has already been uh, practiced by the contemporary art is the self-identified gender bodies by Asian contemporary artists. Okay, so this is the three forms of uh, gender body I want to uh, uh, I want to uh, represent it uh, to date. And uh, thanks to your reasoning, um, uh, is the end of my presentation. And I would like to hear the questions uh, from so the audience in front of the screens, right? Thank you, thank you, Nabo Takamori, and and uh, yeah, but I, I think the information and the sharing is really rich, you know, from the past to now, uh, to now, and not only focusing on Southeast Asia uh, region countries, also related with uh, the the West and the other Asian countries as well. So uh, I, I believe this is uh, definitely your your professional uh, what you're focusing on and the and the research, and and thanks a lot. So uh, okay. uh, after the uh, river things, uh, river's presentation, we will do the QA and the discussion together. Okay, so let's welcome River. 
Hello, everybody. Um, I'm currently in Paris. Um, it's 10.30 a.m. here. Um, so uh, followed by uh, Nabu's presentation under the framework of um, today's thematic um, sharing and discussion, I guess I would like to bring up some other dimensions of um, ways to address the, um, the subject today, which is about um, networking or sort of like the notion of how to build up a friendly networks for gender or um, queer uh, related practice of the artistic scene in the um, Asian context. Um, what I am going to do is not really introduce art artist cases. Do you see my screen? Yes. What I'm going to do is propose a question. So this question is, what does a queer museum slash theater look like? Um, the reason why I address this um, sentence here as the title of the sharing is because I think there is a necessity in terms of um, the arts and cultural institutional sphere to rethink about and to reflect themselves about uh, how as an institutional driven um, eco ecosystem in Taiwan particularly can think further to build up a, a queer idea of presentation and representation among the historical issues as well as the current um, tendencies of today. And this quote, what does a queer museum look like, is actually an event title uh, established um, since 2018, um, run by uh, E.J. Scott, uh, a British um, queer artist and an independent curator in collaboration with Tate Britain and Tate Modern in London. So. Before we could elaborate more about the content about this sentence and under and recover under uh, discover the under what what is underneath, um, I would like to share this um, very short expert excerpt of their conversation in two, uh, 2020. What does a queer museum look like? Series and this is part of the conversations documentary. So I'm EJ. And I'm the curator of the Museum of Transology. And I'm also the curator of this year's Queer and Now Festival 2018. In actuality, for me, my transness is not my identity. My queerness is my identity. The whole thing about queerness is that it can't be defined, that it is the unexpected and that the unexpected can lead to ways of doing things better. There's a lot of us who've been working for a very long time on finding and establishing queer archives that write back in missing narratives. We've done a lot of work to get to this point. Which brings me to my first question, Joe. Why do we need our queer museum to be built of bricks and mortar? So I think it's really important that we have somewhere that is a beacon to people who would never come to an event like this, um, to people who don't see themselves as necessarily part of the queer community, um, but who are LGBTQ, maybe isolated, but will be able to see that there is a, uh, a big, prestigious, um, exciting building that they can go to where they can see themselves reflected. Is it the collecting or the collection that matters? It's both, and it's very much intertwined. And museums are kind of a long game, really. But in order to build a collection that means that it is a museum, that would really take uh, quite a few years. So when I was advocating for an LGBT programme at the National Trust a couple of years ago, I did a sort of a surface level sweep of what LGBT histories do we know at the National Trust? What do we have? And what I found were a lot of stories of extremely wealthy white men who'd been caught and prosecuted for same-sex acts. That was what we knew. That was the, his the queer history that we were acknowledging, that we had access to. So the fact that women's relationships, lesbian relationships, 
haven't been criminalised in that same way. The fact that they've been written out of the law has meant they've been written out of recorded history. And as historians, as curators, we rely on recorded history to tell the truths of the past. It's incredibly rare to find diary entries and letters from women to other women talking about, I really like what we did last night, this is what we did, really explicitly highlighting queer relationships. So if we continue to rely on proof, on evidence of records, we disproportionately write out women's experiences. So we need to look past records, past evidence, and often past sex to find the really positive stories of women's relationships and lesbian relationships that are there hidden in the past, ready to be brought out. For me, the idea of a queer museum would be a huge backstep for lots of people who are here today have been working really, really hard to agitate against what mainstream museums are doing and enacting change from within them. To answer the question that EJ originally sent me, accessibility will, for visitors will be guaranteed by disabled people being fully included from the start because a queer museum will celebrate and acknowledge the body in all its aspects. There will be no need for shame or denial. We care about communities, we care about these pieces, we care about what we're doing, we are we're striving for something beyond ourselves, using the power of the institution in a benevolent and really beautiful way. Asking people when you come into the space, are you open to new learning? Please don't judge or presume based on how someone's presenting, don't use them as a focus for an entire community they represent themselves. I think the creation of values and the display of values is crucial. Institutions like museums, libraries, archives, um, big trusts, funds have to think of like helping, supporting projects that are about those so-called marginalised communities within the marginalised communities. For example, if you look, look at refugees, they don't even have money to get them here to this place. We have to think, how can we enable people, not just that we're providing activities, projects, um, spaces, but also how do we get those people in the spaces? And there's a lot of discussions to be had to be really, really, truly inclusive and diverse. Whether or not we have a Queen Museum, or whether or not we do it in institutions. It is about providing a support and social network where we are giving a space for museum professionals who are from a BAME background, giving us the, the feeling that we can go into our institutions and say, so where's our story? Where, where are we reflected? I think it is very important that we have a museum because there are huge numbers of artists' work and material that is not going anywhere because they won't take them, usually because we're not right for the average viewer. And that work is getting destroyed. I was told again and again that the new safeguarding government regulations say, no, we can't have that because it's too pornographic. What is porn? What is nudity? They're completely different things. But I can tell you, queer art is about who we are and that should be accepted everywhere. Okay. Yeah, and, and I think what you've hit on there is the conversation that surrounds by going into a museum and working within the systems, do we have to de-eroticise our collections? What are we allowed to put on the walls? What is suitable viewing? Who gets to choose what is saved? And so are we actually falling into colonial, heteronormative, cisnormative models just by participating in that world? This is oppressive for me. <laughs> the notion of who defines what queer is and where queer is placed. And the idea that there is a specific idea of where, or even specific ideas that queer have, which are Eurocentric, which are Western, which are metropolitan. Um, so there are places in which, if we're thinking about a, a museum, both in terms of its geographic space, its online and virtual space, what does actually that mean in terms of what that space actually is and who's it for and who can enter into that space safely? So the idea of what is queer has to be investigated. The definition of museum has to be investigated. So it's not necessarily about whether there should be or shouldn't be a museum. It's about the nuts and bolts space, in spiritually, historically, erotically, that we, that we inhabit and have a real honest conversation about that. When does activism become acceptable? And when is it not? Because activism is viewed from a historical lens as, oh, that's, oh the, the suffragettes, weren't they great? Yes, they got us the vote. It's true. Two mad, the last two on the BBC. 
Mm. Yeah. Every yeah. So enough time. So this uh this video um demonstrate to uh, some references and information in that British or Western European um context of how those communities of LGBTQIA plus and queer artist community could uh, get together um, in and host it in within the sphere of the public art institution as Tate Modern, uh, Tate Britain Museum as a national um, um, driven um, contest that to talk about and to destabilize um, those conversation revolving around how to build up and imagine a queer museum, which means um, the idea of addressing a queer museum slash theater here as a question that I propose today is to inviting, um, well, uh, people working in public institutions of arts and culture, as well as the community of, of visual art and performing arts to talk about or to rethink about um, the idea of queerness is no longer uh, just about gender, about LGBTQ, about legalizing same-sex marriage. It's really about so uh, various dimensions within this society. So followed by that uh, video, we could definitely um, um, figure out that the idea of queer, the queer or queerness or queering is something that cannot be easily defined or categorized. And then secondly, a queer museum, the imagination or the representation of a queer museum could celebrate bodies from diverse backgrounds and identities, and as well as to disrupt uh, hierarchies of things. And thirdly, a queer museum might provide a social platform and social network to support the art ecosystem, which means that we can have the perspective of considering uh, public institutions of arts and culture as a platform socially and politically. It's, go, it's going beyond a place to preserve or to collect or to display or to present simply works, but also it's in, uh, it's, it takes actions. It takes, uh, it moves body in motions. And then, it's really also about censorship and permission that who is eligible to be collected, to be presented, and who is defining and deciding the, uh, the presentations and representations of a public institutions of arts and culture should do and can do and want to do. So in this way, perhaps we can also think further about, do we have a queer museum today? You know back to the video, the, the event, basically not. That's why we need to bring these subjects onto the table and to the bright side instead of a shadow to, to, to have this conversation addressed with the public and the audiences and the uh, institutional workers. And secondly, do we have a queer museum in Asia? This is a very interesting question. When I say Asia here, these, um, Nomenclature is really about using the term in Asia. It is to address what has been considered in terms of the colonial history, in terms of this ecosystem of art and culture and the market as well, as well as the trajectory of the LGBTQIA movement in this region. And of course, Taiwan has been lucky to be able to legalize the same-sex marriage in 2019. However, all these aspects of um, human rights movements, as well as the cultural evaluation, um, in terms of progressing this notion and discussion is still on the road. And then, do we need a queer museum? Do we need a queer theater? Do we need our cultural institutions to be queer? And in this way, what is non-queer at the same time? So what does it mean to be queer today? Is, the, is it simply about gender issue creations? Is it simply about LGBTQ related issue putting in your uh, in artist work? Or at the same time, what does it mean to be a queer uh, institutions? And further, what is queer curating? What is a queer curator? You know, this is a also a very interesting question. 
a queer curator doesn't mean or is not represented by this person or they are uh, in terms of their sexual orientation, gay, lesbian, transgender, whatever, it, you know, the, the, the sexual orientation that this person carried does not mean to be their job as a curator should be queer or not. At the same time, when a public or private museum present a queer show or uh, a queer exhibition or a queer theater work or cabaret work, it also doesn't mean that the theater or this museum is queer. So it's really not about what they do in terms of one piece or one project that they host or present. It's about the infrastructure and the structural method, methodology and thinking, ways of thinking about, about, frame, uh, about the framing, at the same time framing the queerness within the institutional actions and activities. So what is curating the queer in this way? So by addressing or proposing this question, I think I would like to say that we will need to, or at the same time are very invited to imagine ways of networking, art making, curating for the queer and heterogeneous time. In this way, I will also like to show um, a brief um, article that a um, few months ago, I was invited by Art Basel as the International Art Fair. And during the COVID period of time, they couldn't really have, well, until last time in Hong Kong, they went physical. However, it has been virtual of their activities and, uh, and dissemination of arts events. So I was invited by Abazo to write about an art ecosystem piece of Taiwan now. And then I thought that, uh, okay, because I'm a performance artist and then uh, I have a queer notion of addressing those political or geopolit uh, geopolitical and cultural uh, aspects. So I contributed this article, Keep Queer and Carry On, The Art of Becoming in Taiwan. So in this article, uh, in this article, I started from the um, Qi Jia Wei, the activist um, Qi Jia Wei's um, public uh, staged conference to come out at the same time, sort of launch the LGBTQ movement back to 1986. He claimed that uh, he called for equal rights for people, including homosexuals. And then in 90s, um, if you know a little bit about Taiwanese contest, there was uh, a lift of the martial law by, uh, imposed by the uh, Chiang Kai-shek's government. And then a lot of um, early pioneering artists of sound, of theater, of visual art, of um, everything have been um, going uh, queer in a way to uh, decentralize the author of authoritarianism or to challenge and question the boundaries of framing and identities. And then what I have been talking about in this article in relation to today's subject or sharing is about, um, is about uh, in Taiwan, the arts institutions have been also queered by younger generation of LGBTQIA artists. For example, here I mentioned uh, the visual artist, visual artist, uh, visual video artist and performance artist Yu Zhen Da's practice, as well as as well as the young indigenous uh, Amis artist Fungus Nayao Chen Yenbin's work, Miss Mi Ah. Uh, Masin Kia uh, made in 2017 in the Mongtu Museum. So in that um, articulation, I sort of like combine or conflicting the idea of queerness to the indigenous art practice because um, being indigenous in Taiwan as the minority of the population and that had also been driven and you know stolen of their uh, territories of the lands of their cultures and languages. This has been also um, imposed. Uh, in, this has been also progressing the trajectory of um, transform uh, transformational justice, in which um, many younger generation of the indigenous artists have demonstrating and manifesting their practice, addressing the alternative um, identities 
in this contemporary art contest. So, for example, in his uh, in Fungus Nayao's work, as conversation involved in that piece, artists invited participants to dance and sing while negotiating the stereotyping of indigenous people in Taiwan, which are made by Sistine tribe as a minority. And then these, uh, although regimes might have changed, but Taiwan has never been abandoned its struggle to be a subverging nation. So in this way, I uh, followed by the case of uh, Fungus Nayao. I also briefly mentioned works of um, Ling Anchi and also the Tuluku choreographer Wadan Tushi, as well as uh, another uh, queer artist, Philippine and Rosemary. And then followed by some artists, uh, uh, like Dong Dong Ho Wen, yes. So in this way, what I wanted to express in this article is also about from gender studies to eco ecological infrastructure, the outing of the artists in this expanded context of queer art in Taiwan today goes beyond identity. It includes sophisticated and radical propositions that challenge the confines of decorum and the state quo destabilizing any notions of framing. So in this way, um, when we talk about the queer art or the um, queer um, artists uh, with their practice today, you perhaps uh, could realize better that actually it's no longer about simply sex or gender no matter its orientation or your sexual preferences, it's about generations, it's about ages, it's about nationalities, it's about genders and races uh, among others. In this way, I would say when we are addressing queer art or the notion of imagining a queer museum slash theater, it is important to know that this tendency to question, protest, challenge and negotiate is where the history of queer uh, indigenous artists uh, practice and activism converge in Taiwan in the 21st century. So if we can rethink about the queer contest in the contemporary um, situation today in Taiwan um, in relation to neighbors who's of this region that perhaps we can imagine this is already beyond, again, sexuality and gender. It's also between identities and identityless. And it's also to deconstruct the androcentrism of historical perspective and representation. And it is to challenge and question the normal and the heteronormative everything. Uh, everything. And then it is, uh, it is at the same time to destabilize uh, the homogenization and the binary systems. Most importantly, it is to perform the fluidity, the fluidity of those um, definitions, of those categories, of those labels. labels. Finally, uh, perhaps a queer museum or a theater, let's say museum here, might be what? This is my um, investigation. It is, uh, it can be questioning or it should be questioning what a museum should be. So if we replace the word uh, museum to theater, same idea. A queer theater might be questioning what a theater should be. So in this way, we are questioning the function of the theater. We are questioning the public responsibility of a cultural institutions, no matter you are city state or national state, when you go public, you, your responsibility of being an institution is to rethink and re-question yourself who you are. And then, a queer museum might be also collecting what has been considered uncollectible or alternative. It means that in terms of hierarchical um, construction within the arts organization and institution, what has been censored, what has been ignored, what has been put in the basement or the storage and uncovered forever, and what has been always deserved to be shown, that's a question. And also a queer museum might be curating shows that challenge heteronormative ideo ideological ecosystem. That means normally 
no matter it's a private museum or public museum, that in this culture um, sphere, most of the shows that we see provided and curated, presented by um, a modern art or a contemporary art museum has been always revolving around a certain uh, ideology, whether whether it's related to um, you know, uh, social issues or um, you know, natural issues or international contest issues such as bi biennial system, you know, like Taiwan Biennial or Taipei Biennial, et cetera. So um, in this way, why not a queer museum should also be producing knowledge, thought provoking, that is thought provoking and role. That means a queer museum, cannot be or is not simply satisfied with something they already know very well or something they already very familiar with and pretty much know how to handle. They should challenge, uh, you know, they, they, they should just get out of their bubble, the Tong Wen Chen, the bubble, and also, you know, to, to uh, embrace um, those, some, uh, those knowledge that unknown and still in progress and role, which means uh, could be uncooked or not come into the consciousness um, in this way. And then a, a queer museum might be no censorship as well as having a variety of employees of different backgrounds and identities. It is also rehearsing notions of work in progress, artistic production. That means in terms of the protocol or the um, Dictionary territory of constructing artworks, which commissioned or produced by a museum. There is a queer thinking about, there is a queer thinking about challenging what artistic production means, as well as the knowledge production in a, a sentence above. And then at the same time, uh, a queer museum might be where various communities in the society are welcome. That means, this community of the society can be from different uh, working class, can be from different nationalities, can be from different parts of the city, or uh, it, it can be coming from the centralized uh, urban space, as well as non-centralized uh, rural area. And then, so how the language and lexicon and the welcoming reception and system of a queer museum can present, that also defined um, how, uh, how they are going to welcome whom to be entered and to be allowed in this museum to stroll or to view our work or to participate in public programs. A social museum, a, a, a queer museum might be also socially engaged and participatory. Here, I'm not simply talking about the art terminologies of socially engaged art or participatory art. It's about how an art institution and network building should be always revolving around social. It means that they constantly welcome and thinking about the presence and the need and the, and the circumstances of the society as well as members of various communities in this way. So when a, when a museum, a queer museum function, functions, um, the agenda that they build up and set up every day and for the near future, for the next season of the exhibition of shows, uh, it's really about they follow up the status or the follow up the process of how this society has been evolving or been confronting in this way, back to the construction of their programmation. So in this way, we might also use the very fashionable term recently in Taiwan, inclusion to be uh, underneath this, uh, what a queer museum might be. So the idea of being inclusive is no longer simply about, okay, you, cre you create um, um, some um, architectural condition that is friendly for disabled people, or you created your audio um, tour, uh, tour guide to serve those um, people who have disability of their uh, bodies. It's also about um, agenda-wise to create this 
in, uh, inclusive spectrum of their their um, uh, presentation and exhibition, as well as the reception of um, uh, of, of 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 how the curators or the exhibition team might confront and being represented um, to the public. So. When we talk about queer now at addressing the arts institution, I, I guess we could also daily um, imagine further about how or how we can expect or what art and cultural institutions that are querying themselves can become and can be um, realized in the near future, no matter in Taiwanese or in the Pan-Asian um, context. Yeah, that was my sharing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, River. Wow. I, I think over uh, uh, both of your presentation really giving us a lot of information of the, uh, no matter from the knowledge side, the historical side, even the, the conception from the, the, the river, you know, this is really, I would say overwhelming. <laughs> yeah, I, I'd like to present uh, ask some question, but I do found uh, one of the audience uh, in the, in the, chat box has already left the message, which I think related to my question. So I will just jump to the question from him, okay? Uh, the Kenneth one, the first question is, for both speakers in talking about Asian queer art, which come first? Asian queer or Asianness of queer or uh, queerness of Asian? Or we just need to admit it, uh, it is a subject that will evolve all the while saying, uh, all the while things queer is about non-conformist beside from LGBT. Yeah. Do I need to paste the question again to you? I, I guess I can quickly respond to mm -hmm. Kenneth. Hi, Kenneth, thank you for your question. I think in this, um, Orders of your um, question by just posing and placing, replacing the um, terminologies of queer slash art and Asian is really depending on how you interpret and understand the term Asia or Asian. Because um, you know, in terms of who comes first, it's really about uh, uh, in that spectrum of your own, that uh, what's the entry point for you? Because if your entry point is about the notion of queering slash queerness or the queer, then um, the idea of national description as Asian perhaps not serve as the first priority when you are addressing certain issues. However, if you if you um you know if you lay um Asian as an adjective to describe queer art, then there has become another contest about as I, as I mentioned briefly, um, is it about colonial history or is it about um the pan contest of how you um allocate yourself of your perspective with uh, between the East and the West and between the North and South. So I think in terms of the geopolitical approach, um, I guess um, Asian queer art doesn't mean this person is having Asian heritage. For example, there has been a lot of discussion about this plural of Asian American uh, Asian African or African American, you know. So in terms of this um, race um, or racial um, spectrum, I guess the idea of queer or when we are talking about queer art, I guess it's also go beyond those nationalities when we are addressing certain uh, speculation as well as the discourse or let's say the discursive progress. Right, so I also would like to address my insert following by Rivert. So um, in my opinion, I think uh, these four uh, questions cannot be like uh, exceptional to each other. 
for example, uh, I think the Asianists and Koreanists, they have kind of uh, projection to each other. So as, I, as River also mentions, it's also related to the uh, geopolitical uh, backgrounds. So, so, uh, so uh, from my viewpoint, I suggest uh, uh, I suggest we should not uh, create uh, this kind of uh, ex exceptional uh, questions, uh, which will be more easy for us to uh, discuss when we engage the the, the field of uh, queerness. Yeah, it's just my short response to Kenneth. So based on what I uh, understanding what uh, River also mentioned about, it's a kind of op about an entry point, right? What kind of perspective you're, you're entering first, right? And, and also, uh, I, I think the two to following back with Kenneth Wong also mentioned about the second one is also what I'm thinking about, you know, we, 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 we're kind of talking about the, the present situation, no matter in Asia or, or Taiwan or the reflection of, you know, uh, globally with each other, the, the country with each other, but also uh, based from, from River and, and Abu, you all mentioned about something. The question too is, uh, if queer art is really activism, uh, activism, will that be one day there is no more queer art? Let's say LGBTQAI or rights plus rights are being uh, gendered, in, gendered in the region over the time, like feminist art, versus art by women or queer art should move away from LGBT related as long as the subject reflect the essence of outsider or others. Yeah. This is probably kind of the, 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 the based on the concept and uh, we imagine kind of the future situation or, or, or what would it be, right? Um, yeah, I guess, um... Um, I well for addressing this question or responding to this question, I think yes or no. Um, I think it's about activism, but it's not all about activism, or at least it's not simply um, only about activism. Um, so, I think the queer practice, or as well as um, social practice, human right practice and movements, as well as LGBTQIA movements among different parts of the world, I don't think uh, one day queer art will disappear or I don't think uh, this entity of how the societies um, from different perspectives or in different geographic um, contexts will um, disappear. However, uh, maybe 10 years later or 30 years later or 50 years later, the situation of democracy and situation of capitalism, the situation of globalization will change. For example, now uh, we have already entered the era of the failure of the globalization due to the COVID-19, right? So, um, Time will change and time has changed already. So I think this is really um, in the um, in-between status uh, as the time or as the society has been constantly um, evolving and change. So uh, in terms of the uh, feminist art that you put up here, I would say, uh, you know, are pretty similar to the notion that I, the way or the way that I interpret and, ch and choose to um, elaborate the queer uh, or the notion of queerness, uh, same. So, you know, uh, you might probably see an artist who is not biological female or who is not uh, mentally self-defined as female makes feminist art. So you might also find a queer artist or a self-claimed queer artist making queer art. At the same time, this person or this group perhaps is cisgender, perhaps is not having their same-sex partner, perhaps their sexual preference is nothing really about 
uh, homosexuality, but it doesn't bother or it doesn't define, you know, this artist is queer or not. So back to the institutional thinking, what makes a curator queer curator or what makes an art institution a queer institution? It doesn't mean that they are gay or a lesbian. In this way, those definitions are already, you know, being left behind, already gone beyond from this um, binary um, system of categories. Mm. So in this way, when we are addressing the androcentrism or the um, heteronormativity, uh, that perhaps define, uh, I mean, when we are addressing the androcentrism and the heteronormativity, that defines um, who is on the margins and who is at the center has been also a strategy for many queer artists to work with. Because for many queer artists, that including those cases um, introduced by Nabu, as well as those living artists that have been involved in this uh, uh, Ikai's cloud residency project. I think many strategy and methodology here for those artists has been really revolving around disturbing or finding ways to destabilize um, those uh, infrastructures of the art ecosystem. And that is for me clear. It doesn't mean that it's, they simply address um, sex and gender. Right, so I, I would like to respond to these questions by the perspective of uh, art history. And in my uh, opinion, to normalize the uh, queer arts in the future is possible for me, but it. But when we talk about the scale of the times, it will take like two or three centuries later. So maybe three centuries later, it will be part of the normalized, uh, part of normalized uh, content of the museum collection. But during uh, these three centuries of normalized, we still need a lot of work to improve it to make sure it becomes the normalized at the end. And I want to uh, make an example of the feminism art, for example. Uh, we all know the, in the Western context, the feminism, uh, like the, the right to vote for the women, is they, uh, just appeared since the late uh, 19th centuries. So for the field of the arts, uh, the feminism art start to uh, practice after the war, but mostly it's the practice in the field of contemporary art. But for the art history, like to research in the female painters in the Renaissance times or the female painters from 17th or 18th centuries, it's pretty late to start. It's just uh, start since uh, like 1980s and 90s. So, so it's just a uh, beginning uh, point of this kind of uh, research field. So when we look at like the uh, art historical, art historical textbook, or when we go to the, uh, for example, when we visit the Louvre, uh, most of the painting we saw are still by the male uh, painters, and we we lost the context and knowledge about the female painters in the history. So which means uh, just by the example of the female artists or the feminism artists, we still need like uh, at least one century or, or one or half, half centuries working to improve uh, the knowledge and also the way of the researching on this topic. And as we note the cure arts, which, uh, uh, which is uh, appears uh, later than the feminism idea. So, so we can say it's, uh, it's take more time and more, uh, more uh, challenges because we are just at the very, very beginning of the uh, history to improve uh, this kind of acknowledgement. Okay, it's just, uh, it's my response for this question. Thank you, thank you. I think we have uh, more questions is coming, especially Zhen Lu, Wang Zhen Lu has raised his hand for a while. <laughs> Yes, Jenry, do you want to turn on your microphone? Can you hear me now? Yes, 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 oh, please. Hello, um, thank you for this speak, it was lovely. Um, 
I have a question, um, both like um, both the two of you and Ikai also mentioned about um, comparing queer theory and feminism. Um, I think for me, um, both of them are fighting against a hierarchical structure, which is um, heterosexual normative, or um, that is um, misogynistically um, dominating. Um, but I think that obviously um, queer art and feminist art are going to, um, you know, we're, we're, writing, we're writing the history right now. But um, my, I guess my question is that um, both of you mentioning, uh, both of you mentioned that to bring the queer art into the museum or um, eliminating the Western gaze or whatever that means or the norm of the aesthetic. Um, however, my question is that what if, because the whole ethos of the theory is to fight against this hierarchical structure, um, but then at the same time we're facing this kind of, are we trying to go towards to this mainstream or are we trying to alienate ourselves from this mainstream? Um, I guess that's, um, that's a question for me that um, what perspective would both of you take? Um, would you um, think that a queer artist should um, gear themselves towards to the so-called mainstream and at the same time alienate they, themselves in some elements or some perspective? Or should they um, just discard the institutional body and be as queer as possible? <laughs> I don't know if I'm, being quick, uh, if I'm being clear, but I think it's a pretty huge question. And just let me know if it's not unclear. Thank you. What's your name? Jenru. Uh, Jenru. 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 Uh, can uh, <laughs> I? Okay. Can I go first? <laughs> go, go, please. <laughs> yeah, thank you for your question, Jenru. I think um, what I have been suggesting from my sharing is not about um, arts institutions should present queer art. It's about how we can imagine a queer art institution. So that's very different. You know, like for example, as I said that a theater or a theater festival might present a gay work or a gay theater production. So a museum might present a queer art exhibition, but it doesn't mean that they are queer. So that's very different. So at the same time, back to your question, um, I do also think the strategy of, you know, demarginizing something or redeploying, as you say, deploying um, those visibilities or, you know, destabilizing those uh, invisibility is also about um, the strategy of queer fluidity. Um, that means, um, for example, when we talk about, um, indigenous art, you know, no matter in visual art contests or in um, performing art contests in Taiwan, in Australia, in New Zealand, in, who is crying? Um, oh my God. Okay. Shall I continue? <laughs> yeah, yeah, go for it. I think okay. just someone so, I mean, you made for, so. for example, in terms of indigenous arts and performance, whether in Taiwan, in um, Australia, in New Zealand, in Canada, among others, in um, you know Northern America, America as well, that those indigenous practice of contemporary art and performing arts has been now a little bit fashionably um, brought together onto central stage. For example, in the Venice Biennale, for example, in many other Biennale <laughs> that you perhaps seen a lot of curators, whether they are uh, indigenous or not, um, constantly presenting indigenous art. But in this way, let's to be, you know, to be honest speaking, does it mean they are now in the central stage? I don't think so. But the reason why, no matter it's on purpose or not, um, arts institutions, um, still need to 
impose this strategy in many different contexts. I don't know, sometimes due to their national cultural ministry strategy, or they have specific funding for that or not. Um, this progress is still very new and young, and I don't bother to jump into conclusion about criticizing you should not present indigenous art in this way or in that way or in national status or in the international stages. However, I think there is still necessity of seeing that, and there is a necessity of bringing that cases, those cases in discussions. And I think to have discussions towards that cases and examples uh, is ways of uh, visibilizing um, those subjects or uh, objects um, onto the art contest, into the art contest. So in this way, I do not think uh, when we are addressing queer art, we are simply defining who is or what is at the center or not. It's about when we address representation and representation, particularly in the institutional sphere, that how we can think further and challenge those protocols. Thank you. So I would like to uh, reply to Jenu's question, and also it could be also the re uh, my response to uh, Reba's uh, talk today. And uh, I think uh, I think t uh, to uh, to uh, incept the queerness in the museums is might be kind of uh, very challenging, but also problematic. Um, uh, process because uh, as I mentioned in today's representations, um, the museum itself is the result of the uh, modernized national state, and um, but so so on the one hand, when uh, Robert mentioned about the cured museums, uh, I just uh, instantly respond that uh, maybe it's the private foundations or the. Uh, or the uh, no government taught uh, organizations will be to make these things uh, better or more interesting than the public institution. But on the other hand, I, I just mentioned that um, if we can inception the queerness into the public institutions, maybe it will be more uh, interesting or lots of the public institutions will be always not so independent or always not so progressive compared to the uh, individual artists and group. But if somehow we can uh, incept kind of a queerness uh, methodology or queerness thinkings in just one uh, public institutions, maybe it's a kind of a weight or a kind of a kit to, uh, to uh, lead us to kind of a post-colonized uh, management. So, so it's just my short response to both Rebels and Jim. Thank you, thank you, both of you. I, I think we we have only seven minutes left, and but there's one audience I really wanted to having a conversation with us. Two, uh, two has already participated our uh, event two days in a row and really active and always came up with a really interesting ideas or the questions. Uh, and she also has some questions and leave in the chat box, but I'd like to ask her to unmute herself and maybe can, uh, raise the question. Hello. Thank you, Kai. Thank you. Um, so I have a question to River. Um, so I can see that River has a really um, a kind of encompassing idea of what queer <coughs> means. Um, and I think the questions I have here is whether should we clarify what kind of scopes and canons that we are, you know, we're deploying or what we are addressing when identifying these practices, whether they're in institutions or whether they're in individual practices, because I feel like perhaps having um, an encompassing idea or concept of what queer might mean, it's it's, it, it's really needed, but at the same time, if we don't, if we can't be uh, careful about what we are talking about or what we are framing, perhaps we, we might risk the language or experiences coming out from the trauma and pain rooted in many queer lives. And so I wonder uh, what would be your view on it? 
wrap up. Thank you. Thank you too. Um, yeah, I'm thinking about the context of your question about uh, risk languages slash experiences coming out from trauma, pain, and personal individual um, human lives, queer lives. Um, well, I, I, I would like to also maybe clarify myself a little bit because um, my brief sharing uh, didn't really mention like um, certain artist practices, pre uh, practice. Uh, I was just, you know, going to the link uh, to, or the attachment to the um, article that I wrote for Abazo for introducing Taiwanese queer art ecosystem. So I guess the context of my sharing addressing queer notion as taking my individual or you know cultural um, understanding of what has been in Taiwan in relation to a pan context of um, the the wide spectrum of queerness. So that's why I that's why in my understanding and imputation the queer today or the queer art slash practices in society within different parts of the um, Sophia has been revolving around for me going beyond those um, categories or binary systems. Uh, but I, yeah, I guess, I guess uh, there is uh, also necessity of when we talk about um, queer art, we also talk about human lives. So in this way, I guess in many different um, country in relation to the various trajectory of the LGBTQIA movement, um, lots of um, progress have been involved, uh, uh, have been revolving around um, human rights. And of course, this is part of the queer uh, practices today. I don't know if I, answer your question about this clarifying scope or, yeah. Yeah, that was rather cl um, clearer than before. Uh, one of the example I used to, 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 uh, to locate my previous question in terms of trauma and pain was the example I, 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 I talked about, well, I think it was, it was in 2019 or 20, uh, it, was, it happened during the pandemic when, when uh, the Black Lives Matter, Black, Black yeah, Black Lives Matter happened during the pandemic and when Matt Queen, a British uh, sculptor, erected a, human, a, a woman statue in Bristol. And this, you can say, well, he is a man practicing feminist art, right? Mm -hmm. But his, the, the, this action um, caused a lot of backfire because a lot of Black women didn't think that he has the agency, he can do that in, on behalf of them. So this... This was my. Uh, this was what grounded my 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 questions about, you know, when we're having this kind of so um, open ident uh, not not identity but more like open framework to approach queer practice. You know, there there might be some dangers or some pitfalls that people will probably have to try to navigate or have to be really aware of in relation to their identity, their privilege, their, their position. So right. that was my questions. And I wonder how you would address this or how you would respond to this. Right. Um, uh, I think it's um, pretty similar. I mean, there has been always a problematic or, um, or discussion for the dimension of socially engaged art. Um, for example, like uh, in Taiwanese contexts that uh, some contemporary artists that you use the phenomenon or the uh, entity of um, migrant workers to address the socially engaged and uh, slash participatory work or um, artists, some contemporary artists uh, would worked with uh, we work with um, ecological issues. So I guess this is something 
um, pretty similar that when we are trying to talk about if this um, artists have the agency or the um, political correct status to address certain issues. I guess I would suggest, uh, or at least for me, uh, there's also there's always another way of um, viewing it, because I guess the most important thing at I mean, vitally is about the tendency of the work and the tendency of the, the, the intention of the artists themselves. Perhaps their methods or their appearance could be problematic, but when we are talking about this, I think it's also um, crucial that as viewers or as critics, that we should come back to the context or at least the contextualization of why and how uh, instead, instead of um, you know, too um, quickly um, jumping into a conclusion of binary system, because this is also another dangerous um, perspective that we, uh, when we are following that kind of binary system of taste and judgment, that would be also problematic for us to regard um, cases. Okay, I don't, I, I don't think we have enough time to continue this conversation, but thank you. Thank you, River. Yeah. Thank you, thank you Kai. Okay. Yeah, okay. Thank you, thank you all of you, you, you guys, uh, your participation. And one more thing, River and, and uh, Nabu Takamoni, if the audience would like to maybe contact you or knowing some more information or having discussion with you, is there any way or any information uh, we can contact you, like your email or something? Uh, I I think maybe the, the audience could uh, contact me shorts uh shorts uh you first. Okay, sure. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so if there's any questions uh, if you want, you can leave in our uh leave the question in our uh sorry, the website and our staff will leave the website link uh through in the chat box. And thank you all uh to to join uh joining us in the presentation and the talks in the past two days. Uh, uh, in the whole afternoon. And this is our last session. And once again, our project uh, and, and the website link, uh, website, we will still keep it for at least a month. If you want to know more, or if you have any, anything would like to exchange the idea with us, come to the website and leave the message. We will try our best to, to no matter transit to, to transfer to the audience, uh, sorry, to the artists or the uh, speakers, and then we can have more conversation. <laughs>